And there were other nations that had a cow or a bull or something that they worship. Uh, even in the Hindu religion today, they, they worship uh, cows and bulls and things like that. Won't starve to death with cows walking all around them. Won't kill those cows, won't eat a bite of it because to them that's a god. Boy, if that cow's God, we're all in trouble. Because I grew up on a farm. We had cattle, and I can tell you there's nothing smart about those cows. Amen? Uh, but that, that's what they did. And uh, then, of course, we talked about the God of, uh, of Moloch that they worshipped and how they worshipped him in Canaan and sacrificed their babies uh, in the arms of that bull as they would build a fire in its belly. But let's pick up in verse 44, or verse 43, I'm sorry. He said, yea, uh, yea, ye took up the tabernacle of, of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And he says in verse 44, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. So, in other words, God gave him a vision. God gave him a visual of what he was to build. God gave him minute details of this tabernacle. I mean, nothing was left to chance. God broke it down. He gave him every measurement. And uh, so that was covered. And uh, that's what God is getting at here. And uh, said, so then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Uh, and, and, uh, I'm sorry, I backed up the wrong verse. Uh, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion uh, that he had seen, which also our father that came, our fathers that came after brought in with Joshua unto the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. So he's talking about uh, uh, Joshua there, and uh, and then uh, and and David, and then he's and then he's, so Joshua first, and then David. David wanted to build God a tabernacle, and God would not let him build that tabernacle for a reason. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then Solomon comes along, David's son, and God uses Solomon to build a tremendous tabernacle, and it said built him, built God he built him a house, built God a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Again, Stephen has defended himself here because he's been accused of blaspheme of the temple. And he said, Heaven, is, uh, he, talking about God, he said, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all, the, all these things? Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. That's a serious, serious charge. Resisted the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. I want to stop there and begin to make comments. Boy, that last, that last verse is something, too. You've received the law of God uh, uh, by the dispensation of angels. We'll talk more in depth about that in a moment. But, he said, but even though the angels brought it to you, you have not kept it. Uh, there, there's another scripture in Psalms, and we'll read it in a few moments, that talks about how the angels were present, uh, at thousands upon thousands of God's angels, uh, to help bring these things to pass. I believe there are probably many angels in this room with us tonight. All of them may not be inside the church. There may be many outside, but it, that's, that's another story. But let's back up to verse 44. In verse 44, he said, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. The whole thing behind that scripture is this. God gave Moses the exact measurements for that tabernacle, why did they need a tabernacle? Why did they need this, these curtains? And why did they need the Ark of the Covenant? Why did they need the holy place and the holy of holies and, and, and the pieces of furniture that, that um, uh, made up those places or were, were housed in those places? Well, here's the thing. Israel, when they made that golden calf going back to the wilderness, what they were saying then and there was, we want to be like every other nation. 
Every other nation has a God they can see. Every other nation has a God they can put on a cart and put him in the parades. Every other nation has a God in their shrine. We can go into the buildings and we can find them. We can look and say, there's, there's God. There's where God is. That's our God. And, and so they wanted a God like everybody else. Well, i tell you what. There are a lot of false gods in our world tonight. And one thing I'm happy to report, the God of, of, uh, of, of uh, our, the God that we serve tonight is not like the other gods of the world. Amen. You can't go in a building and look at a small figure and say, there's God. Amen. You can't, you can't look at, go to your house and enter your living room and look on a mantle and point at something and say, there he is, there's God, because our God's way too big for that. And, but God gave them this portable tabernacle, and, he, and it's a scale, very much a scaled-down model of what appears in heaven. When God gave Moses the measurements for that mercy, for the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, and we could, we could spend all night talking about that, and, and, and talking about the mercy seat that sits atop of the, mercy, of the Ark of the Covenant, the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. But when God gave them that, we know that that, that little Ark of the Covenant is a, a sure enough uh, scaled down version of the throne of God. I believe the Lord allowed, maybe on Mount Sinai, when the glory of God covered the top of that mountain, that, that God was allowing Moses to see into the other world and, and see the throne of God because when Moses came down, he had the measurements, but he also had a visual because the Word of God says that Moses was instructed to build it like he had seen it. And, and, and the whole thought process behind that is there's a lot of people tonight trying to build a religion. And they're trying to build a religion that suits them. They're trying to build a religion. They're, they're, out, they're out today surveying people to find out what they would want in a great religion. What, what, what would make them get involved in some kind of religious organization. And they're taking those surveys and they're trying to, they're trying to tailor make something that will fit the neighborhood. Or that will fit the culture. But God gave this thing to Moses. He said it's got to be built just like I tell you to build it. I'm giving you the exact measurements. I'm giving you the ex exact pieces of furniture. I'm giving, you, I'm giving you every detail, the colors. I'm telling you everything. I'm telling you the materials, and it's got to be built just like I take. What God is saying there is, I won't be a part of anything that did not originate from me. Amen? Adam and Eve found that out in the garden. You've heard me talk about probably too many times already how they made their own covering, and God would not accept it. In fact, it was a very uncomfortable covering. And it was not until God killed an animal and made them a covering of animal skins that they had any comfort at all, but still ran from God. So what I come to declare to you tonight is God is showing Moses, and this is what Stephen is picking up at, and he's preaching this to the, to the Sanhedrin court. Uh, he said, look, you know, you've got the law, but you don't abide by the law. Uh, you talk about being law keepers. You're not law keepers. You, you break those laws every day. Uh, you want to brag about keeping the law, but you're not keeping the law. He said, but if you're, going to have, if you're going to have God in your life, you've got to line it with God's Word. And if you're going to have religion that includes the Father, then you've got to do it the Father's way, not your way. Amen? Uh, uh, you know, I heard somebody teach one time a series, and it was called Yahweh or Your Way. <laughs> We all know that Yahweh is the, is the Jewish term for Jehovah. And, and when he said Yahweh or your way, what he's saying is it's, it's got to be God's way or it's going to be your way, but it, it can't be a combination of the two. It won't work. Amen? We can try to combine them. God will not get in on what we're doing, but God says, I'm going to give you the plan. And if you'll get it on my plan, it'll work. Amen? How many don't tell the truth on that? So God gave them the tabernacles. He gave them the instructions to make those pieces of sacred furniture. And they built it in the way that God instructed them. And, and the worship of the Hebrews was to be completely different than anybody else's worship. Here's why. When they went into their, it wasn't a shrine, but when they went into that tabernacle, the thing that set that tabernacle apart from every other, from all the shrines that they had seen, uh, it, or all the uh, 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 places where they worship idols, the thing that set it apart is, there was not a figure in that tabernacle to worship. Amen? There wasn't a statue to bow in front of. There was no figure carved out, out with the hands of man to go up there and shine it up and say, you look good today. By the way, I have a need. You didn't do that. You didn't bow before a statue or anything like that. What did you do? Well, we know the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement 
would go in the most holy place, the holy of holies. And while he was in there, he would begin to worship. And, he would, and, and as he's worshiping in that place, and as he's slinging the blood around the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God would come down and rest between the cherubim on the mercy seat. It was the Shekinah glory of God. And even the children of Israel standing on the outside of the tabernacle watching could see the glow of God. As you see, the glow of God was the only light they had in the Holy of Holies. They had the golden candlestick out there in the holy place. But the only light they had beyond that four-inch thick curtain that went from top to bottom, the only light that was in there, the only light that could light at that place was when the glow of God came in that room. God said, I am the light. I'll be the light in this room. Amen? And so no other shrine compared to that because all these other shrines had these little relics that people would bow to, all these little relics that they would worship. But God said, you're not going to have a statue, but you're going to have my Shekinah glory. You're going to have my presence. I'll come down and rest between the cherub. But when the high priest first went in there, all he saw was the mercy seat. There was no figure on the mercy seat. Just these cherubim. And they're there with their wings arched. And they're just waiting for God to show up. Amen? And that is the way it is in heaven. God wanted the priest, the high priest, to look at that mercy seat and say, My, my, this is what's going on in heaven right now. But the only thing is is God never leaves the throne in heaven. Hallelujah. We've got to pray Him down to the throne here. We've got to pray Him down to the mercy seat here. But He never leaves the mercy seat there. Glory to God. Amen. That that mercy seat was to remind them that there's something going on in the unseen world that we may serve a God that we cannot see. but But that does not take away from His power. That does not diminish His knowledge. He is very much God and He's on the throne tonight. Can somebody shout amen? amen? Praise God. God's Shekinah glory. Thank God for it. And, and, and you know, those who worshipped idols, they had a one-way worship. Those who worshipped idols, they would go before these gods that they'd carved with their own hands, and they would worship and worship, and they would, some of them would cut themselves, and some of them would offer their children on the altars, and, 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 and they would do, some of them made animal sacrifices, but it was one way worship because that statue can't hear, and it can't see, and it can't speak, and it will never develop a relationship with the one who is worshiping. But thank God, thank God, thank God. In the house of God, we've got two way worship going on because when we begin to worship God in spirit and in truth, when we worship, Worship Him with all of our heart. All of a sudden, the power of the Lord, the presence of God, begins to rain down in the house. And God said, I will remind you that while you're worshiping, I will feel the atmosphere around you. The Word of God says, God inhabits the praises of His people. When we worship Him, God will come around us and our lives will be changed. When the Lord shows up, everything changes. Everything changes. Our outlook changes. We become encouraged. We, bec- we receive strength. I mean, everything changes. Amen? And God does a tremendous work in our lives. We have, with the joy of the Lord begins to flow. Our faith increases. All these things begin to happen. And the Bible said that when they, um, the, in the latter part of verse 44, said, seeking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion which he had seen. It had to come exclusive, exclusively from God. He could go to the store and buy a magazine and pick it out and say, yep, that's the one I'm going to build right there. I like to build stuff. I remember one day I thought, I'm just going to build some dog houses and, and just see if I can sell them. I just put the type dog house in the web search Google thing, and it pulled up a dog house that uh, Lowe's had, and I, I built it. And I pulled up another, and I built, I built a big and I built a small one. Uh, and I added, I just done my own thing to some of it. I mean, they, they had some instruction. I thought I could improve on it, but not God's way. Not when you're, not when you're doing something for God. You don't add to it. There's a lot of people tonight that want to add to the Bible. There's a lot of people tonight that want to take away from the Bible. And they think, I, I believe I can tweak this. I believe I can make this. But I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of that going on in our world tonight. 
There are folks that says, well, we can't, you know, we got to love everybody. And because we have to love everybody, we got to quit preaching on this and quit preaching on that. And, and we got to quit bringing it up in church. We got to quit bringing it up here and there. And, and we can't preach on it anymore. Can't sing about the sin anymore and all these things. Can't testify about all these things. I'm here to tell you if the Bible calls it sin, the church, we don't beat people up. We're not trying to be mean to people. But there's a time when the Lord lays it upon the heart of the preacher to preach against something. You got to, but here's the thing when, you, when we preach against something, Thank God we can turn right around and preach for something. You can preach against sin, but you can tell people God's for you. And God doesn't want you to be tied to these sins. God doesn't want you to die and go to the devil's hell. He sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish. Leave that sin. Come to Christ, and He'll free you from the chains of bondage and set the captives free. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. You don't even, and you don't even have to tell it in that preacher voice. Amen. Praise God, praise God. And he said, build it according to this fashion. Build it according to God's word. Build the church according to God's word. Build the religion. Build the denomination according to God's word. Amen. Look at verse 45. Verse 45 says, Which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. That should have been translated Joshua, by the way. Whom God drave out before uh, the face of our fathers unto the days of David. Uh, Joshua uh, tried to help them, and he took possession of the land, uh, the, the land of Canaan. He led them into the land of Canaan. They took possession of it, and, and they inherited that land. Uh, but, but, but it wasn't all that they needed. The tent, the tent remained uh, uh, here until the time of, of David. And, and so, so when Joshua died... When Joshua died, there was a terrible deterioration of spirituality among the Jewish people. Things went downhill. They began to turn their backs on God. They began to worship pagan gods. Uh, they began to pay less and less attention to the law of God. And things went downhill until David was anointed to be king. Now, we know that the people begged for a king. God gave them Saul. Uh, or God gave them, uh, Saul. Uh, not because he wanted to, but because the people kept demanding it. So God gave them Saul. And, and, and we know that Saul, uh, for a while, God blessed under Saul, but not very long because Saul turned his back on God. When Saul went to the enemy to find out what he needed to do, he brought a curse on that nation. Amen? Uh, you know, uh, well, I won't go there. But anyway, that's another story. We've had some presidents in, our, in the White House do the same thing. Uh, but you never consult with the devil to find out what you need to do. I'm al I've been alarmed as a pastor over the years. Not, not even my church people, but I'd, I would find people, knowing people, working around people that were raised Pentecostal. And I'd hear them talk about going to some madam to find out what their future holds or what, they, what decision they need to make about something. I remember there's a little, a little a girl that was raised Pentecostal, a young lady, raised Pentecostal. And, 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 uh, and I knew that she had been raised Pentecostal, but she had been out of church. And she talked about going to some uh, uh, medium or something, and, 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 and the medium, I don't know if it was with cards or something, began to tell her future. And I said, you mean you did that? Well, yeah, because I want to know. I'm really trying to make an important decision here. And I said, you know what? what were you not raised in a Holy Ghost-filled church? Well, yeah. And I said, you need to get back in that church and give your life back to Christ and consult the power of God because the steps of a good person are order of the Lord. If you want to know your future, you don't have to. God may not reveal everything about your future. But when you turn to those people, I didn't mean to get off on this, the demons of hell are the one that's guiding you. God will never speak through some soothsayer. God will never speak through some fortune teller. God will never speak through some medium. Well, what about these that supposedly talked to my ancestor? Yeah, some demonic spirit that knew your ancestor. It spoke through that medium. Amen? It wasn't God. Come on, can I get amen on that? So don't be fooled by the devil. Don't be feeding demons. Amen? When you begin to brag, uh, brag about things like that, you're feeding the demons. When you begin to talk negative talk, you're feeding the demons. Don't feed the demons. Amen? But then David, Saul did not work out. When God, when God brought David along and anointed David to be king, God began to bless Israel again. It, uh, before David came to be the king, things began to deteriorate for Israel to, to, to a, a great degree. I mean, they were losing battles. 
they, they were giving up territory. Everything was going wrong. It seemed like for Israel. But when David came to the king, David, the Bible said David was a man after God's own heart. David not only had a heart for God, he said, I want the heart of God. I want to be and I want to know the heart of God. I want to know the will of God. And when, and when David began to seek God like that, I'm telling you, the Lord began to bless. And when God began to bless, I'm telling you, Israel began to prosper. They began to win all their battles. They began to conquer in every area. They were more than overcomers. They were more than conquerors. And that's what worshiping the true God will do for you. That's the point Stephen is trying to make to the Sanhedrin court. He's trying to say, if you will put God first, if you will only hear the voice of God, accept the will of God, stop rebelling, stop rejecting God, the Lord will bless you beyond men. But God cannot bless rebellion. Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. So, thank God. But then, we know David had his problems too. There were times that he allowed sin to come into his life. And we'll preach on that another time. But under David's leadership, because during that time that he was seeking God and going after God's own heart, Israel became the most powerful, one of the most powerful nations in the world. When you exalt God, God will bless the nation. When a nation turns its back on God, it will always go backwards. Amen? Things will always go backwards. In Acts chapter 7, hey, I don't know if I want to do this or not. When the nation makes bad decisions, when the nation votes in leaders that uphold ungodly, ungodly, I want to put ungodly laws in place, laws that contradict the Word of God, then the economy of the nation always goes south. Amen? When does the eco economy improve? When the nation begins turning back. Turn, not, ev not, not everybody. We know that. There's a lot of people in our nation today that are blind as can be, fooled by Satan. We wonder how people can act the way they're acting today. How can, they, how can they say the things they're saying? How can they talk the way they're talking, make the decisions that they're making? How can some of our politicians be what they are because they are blinded by Satan? Amen? But David was a man after God's own heart. God blessed him. And that's what Stephen's pointing out. Uh, and the Bible said, Acts, uh, look at verse 46 and 47. Who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for, for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. David, David was allowed to build the house. And here's why. David, uh, this may sound strange when I first said it, but David was a type of Christ. A type of Christ. A foreshadow. He was a type of conquering Christ. But God wouldn't let him build the house, a house for him. Why? That David wanted to do it so bad, it, it was just, he was consumed by it. But God said, David, you can't do it because you have blood on your hands. You are the conqueror. You're the one who goes to battle. In other words, he represents the God of judgment. Amen? David was a warrior. He brought down Goliath, and he brought down Goliath's brothers, and he brought down many armies. After That's why the children of Israel, long before David arose to the throne, the children of Israel were going out around singing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands. They were not exaggerating. David had, he had killed his ten thousands. He had led his, a group of men. They had killed ten thousands. Why? They went under the anointing of the Most High God. Saul has killed his thousands. But David is, I'm telling you, the presence of God makes the difference. Amen? You can look at a person and wonder how, I want to be careful here, but when you, you look at people involved in the ministry sometimes. I, you know, I've had friends that, that some started a ministry about the time I did. They have very little to show. They really haven't gone anywhere. They've never really, really done anything. Some of them never even went on to get license. And that, not that you have to have license to... That's another story. But anyway, they, they announced they were called to preach, but it just never got off the ground. Why? There's Saul's and there's David's. Amen? There are people like Saul that says, I'm going to do just enough to get by. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not, I'm not going to really seek God that much. But there are people like David after God's own heart. The people that are like David that are after God's own heart, I'm telling you, they don't just pray them little lay-me-down-to-sleep prayers at night. 
they don't just pray over their meals. I'm telling you, they're men and women of prayer. And, you know, they, they earnestly pray, and they, they pray fervently before God. They seek the face of God. The Lord, they seek God until the Lord begins to speak, and God begins to direct, and they begin to take orders from God. And when the Holy Ghost begins to lay out your steps, I'm here to tell you, something good is going to happen. Amen? Hallelujah. That's some good preaching, but I don't have time to park there very long. Amen. Who found faith? This is the thing. Who found favor before God? Who found favor before God? David did. David found faith. Boy, nothing better can be said about somebody in that they have found favor before God. Everybody in this room, if you have it already, you can find favor before God. What do you have to do? Just sell out to Him. Don't hold anything back. Give Him your all. Amen. Don't try to keep those... Don't try to hold on to secret sins. Don't pet those hidden sins. Get them to the altar. Get rid of them. Amen. Get rid of those things you're struggling with and begin to seek the face of God. Oh, I'm here to tell you, it makes all the difference in the world. Amen. A man after God's own heart, you'll find him with a Bible in his hand most often. A man after God's own heart, you'll find him on his knees very often. A man after God's own heart, you're going to find him consulting, amen, praying with the Holy Ghost, hearing from heaven. Come on, somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. Talking about David and desire to find a tabernacle for God to dwell in. And, uh, and uh, we, we know that uh, the Ark of the Covenant had been brought into Jerusalem after being unattended for 70 years. David wanted that Ark back in Jerusalem. He pushed to get it back. He took off his clothes, danced in the street, a mighty dance because the Ark of the Covenant was coming back into town. I don't think David even waited to cross the city limits. I think he looked out in the distance and saw the Ark of the Covenant knowing that that represents the very throne of God, knowing that we're about to see the Shekinah glory of God come down again. We're putting ourselves in a position for to have revival like we've never had it. Amen. We're bringing the Ark of the Covenant. We're bringing the mercy seat back into the community and the Lord's going to occupy that place again. Jerusalem's going to be a holy place once again and David just began to dance before the Lord with all of his might and his, and his wife's looking out the window thinking you crazy thing not everybody's going to worship with you amen there's a lot of people in this world going to laugh at you going to mock you keep on worshiping God come on can I have a witness so David was a type of Christ but as a conqueror Solomon was allowed to build the temple why because Solomon was also a type of Christ what was Solomon? He was the king that reigned during the time of peace. He was the king that reigned during the time of peace. Now, here's, this is important. We know that the Bible says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. Seated at the right hand of God. That word seated indicates he's the God of peace. He is seated at the right hand of God, waiting for the time of judgment to come. But a little bit later on, just a few verses down, Stephen, is they're, they're rushing towards Stephen to stone him to death. Stephen looks up and the Bible said he saw the heavens open. God said, Stephen, you're so close to me, just look up here. I'm going to let you see where you're headed. <laughs> Before the first rock hits your noggin, I'm going to let you see where you're headed. Look at this beautiful place. Don't look at them, just keep looking right there because that's where you're about to come to. Glory to God. And Stephen said, the Bible says he looked up into heaven and he saw the glory of God. Even when he saw the glory of God, he saw the majesty of the throne. He, oh, even greater than that, he saw the majesty of the one who occupies the throne. As I mentioned earlier, that, that, old, that uh, mercy seat does, does not have anything set in on it. It's got the cherubim, they're waiting. They're waiting for the one who was set between them to show up. But the real throne, that the one that that thing's a replica of, God has never left the throne. He is on, the, and when Stephen looked up, he saw God on the throne. He saw the majestic God, but something else he saw. He saw Jesus standing up standing at the right hand of God. The reason Jesus stood up, I believe he had the crown of life in his hand, saying, Stephen, come on up. They may be treating you bad down there, but when you get up here, look what I've got for you. I'm going to put the crown upon your head. I'm going to put the robe upon your shoulders. I'm going to treat you far better than they're treating you. Glory to God. 
when it comes time for a man to leave this world, if he can get a glimpse of heaven, if he can just get a glimpse of the throne of God, if he can just see Jesus standing there waiting on him, I stood up for you, come on. Amen. Jesus will stand up for you too. If he'll stand up for Stephen, he'll stand up for you. There's a lot of preaching in that. Amen. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. That's all right. We're about to get out of time anyway. Hallelujah. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, the Bible said, He that committed the sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. I'm telling you, there is not one person on the sound of my voice that was meant to struggle and struggle and struggle and fail to get free from sin. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of sin, that He might break every yoke of bondage, that He might release you from every chain that's ever held you in bondage. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. You can be free. Amen? I'm almost preaching my Sunday night sermon again, aren't I? Hallelujah. Praise God. Boy, that'll preach too. Acts chapter 7, verse 48. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, saith the, saith the prophet. So S Stephen is, is taking the words of Isaiah and he's preaching to the people that's getting ready to stone him to death. He said, Isaiah, the prophet said, Our God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. And what Stephen is really saying is, as great as that temple is, as much as you think about it, they're worshiping that temple, keep in mind. He says, you really think you can confine God to that building? You really think you've got to have that building for God to be in your midst? God doesn't need that building. And you can't confine God to that building. He's the God that created the heavens and the earth. He's the God that created everything that you see. He created the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof. Glory, glory, glory. Did you hear what I said? He's the God who created the heavens and the earth and everything therein. Praise God. How can you contain that God? How can you put him in a building? You can't get God down to that size. You might get the Shekinah glory to come down. That's a part of God. It's not all of God. Amen. Praise God. We've not seen all of him. Amen. But Stephen pointed out, God sent Moses, you rejected him, threw him out. God sent Joseph, you, you, you sold him into slavery and mistreated him. God sent Jesus and you crucified him. But he's still reaching out to you. But the difference is, you know, well, even those who rejected Moses the first time finally had to acknowledge that he was God's man. And those who rejected Joseph eventually had to go down to Egypt and sit under him to be saved, to get the food they needed to survive. And those who have rejected Jesus will in no way be saved until they come back to the one they have once rejected. You've got to come back to Jesus and you've got to acknowledge that he is the Lord, the Master, and the Savior. There's coming a day where every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Those who crucified Him will do it. Those who hated Him will do it. And those who love Him will do it. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. The Antichrist will be out of the picture by then. Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 12 verse 6. Jesus said about Himself. He said, this is the place uh, that in this place is one greater than the temple. That's what Jesus said. In this place is one greater than the temple. Don't get caught up in buildings. Worship in buildings. Worship the God who, who comes down in that place when the activity is going on. Amen. And uh, so how can you build God a house? When the earth is footstool and, the, and the, uh, the heavens is his throne, how can you build God a house? Don't think too much of buildings. Know that God is God. Amen. I'm, I promise I'm trying to close. I'm almost there. Look at verse 50 and 51. Hath not my hand made all these things, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears? You do always resist the Holy Ghost. Um, your fathers did, and so do you. That, that scripture is loaded, and, and here's what he's saying. The Jews, they were big on circumcision, and, and, and to them, anybody was that, that, did, that did not practice that, they weren't worthy even speaking to. 
That's why they looked down at the Gentiles. God had gave them that as a covenant. But they began to worship the practice rather than the one who gave it to them. And when Stephen made that statement, he said, you are uncircumcised in heart. What he was telling me is, is you've got religion on the outside, but you are dead on the inside. You've got all the appearance. You've got, you, go, you go to the right church. You're doing all the right things. You're going through all the right motions, but nothing's changed inside of you. You still reject Jesus as the Messiah. You're still dead as can be. That even Jesus, when he came on this, when Jesus was on the scene, he said, you're like whited sepulchers. You come up on you, you look beautiful. You shine in the sun, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. But I'm so glad there's one that can resurrect the dead. Glory to God. I'm glad there's one that can call out to the bone yard and say, come alive, come alive. And they will come alive. God can raise up an army out of the bone pile. Glory to God. Amen. Somebody give him praise in this house. But that part about you do always resist the Holy Ghost. What's he said? He said, I've come to preach. I preached you on the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And what did they do? The Bible, listen, the Bible said they act like little children. They went. They gnashed their teeth. I won't make that face again, I promise. They gnashed their teeth and they stopped up their ears. That's what the Bible said they did. Think about that for a moment. They're acting like a year and a half old. Gritting their teeth and stopping up their ears. We won't hear it. We won't hear it. You know, they got so loud that they, they're trying to drown out what Stephen's saying. The world's making a lot of noise tonight. Satan is making a lot of noise tonight. He's trying to drown out the voice of God. But John the Revelator talks about one whose voice is like the voice of many waters. He talks about one who, that, that, uh, that about great thundering. I'm here to tell you when God, there's going to be a day when God gets ready to speak that His voice will overpower and overshadow every other voice. If you've got lost loved ones that you think they can't, they they just. They're at that place they cannot possibly hear from God. You keep on praying because the one who speaks with the voice of great waters, of many waters, is able to speak up and overpower the influence of this world, overpower the voice of their peers, overpower the voice of backslidden people, overpower the voice of, of, uh, of, of agnostic teachers uh, and college professors uh, and bring the word of God to life in their hearts. Glory to God. Come on, somebody shout amen. When the people rejected the Holy Ghost, they rejected the messengers, what's being said. And I, I could spend some time there, but I don't have it. But I really want to get to verse 53 tonight. Who hath received the law by the dispensation of angels, but did not keep You haven't kept it. God sent his angels to bring you the law. Now, you might first look at that and say, well, I don't remember that. I know that... Moses went up on the, on the mountain and God gave him the tablets and it came down. Well, look, at, look what the psalmist said. Psalm 68, verse 17. The chariots of God are 20,000 and even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. When did Sinai become a holy place? When God met Moses on top of that mountain. When, the, when that glory cloud covered the top of the mountain, when, when those Israelites looked up and they saw lightning flashing, and they saw the glory cloud cover, and Moses came down with a face glowing like the sun because he had stood in the presence of the Almighty. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, and, and I believe the angels were all over that mountain. In fact, somebody said that scripture literally means 200 million angels. I don't know. It says 20,000, then upon thousands. It's making a magnification there. I'll, I can tell you this. There was a whole lot of angels in that place. Amen. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. That makes me think about, I think, was it Elijah or Elisha that had the servant that looked out the window? Was it Elisha? Elijah. His servant looked out the window and, saw, and, and it didn't see anything. He said, oh, Elijah, we're in trouble. And Elijah went over and prayed and said, Oh God, let him see what I see. Lord, I look out there and I see those, our enemies bad outnumbered. 
Our enemy's in sad shape. Would you open the eyes of my servant? Servant, go look out that window one more time. He goes and looks and said, oh my. Mm -mm. God's got angels everywhere. Hey, well, this is, going to be a, this is going to be an ugly fight for the enemy. Hallelujah. I'm telling you what, God's, we may not see them, but I be, I, there are times when you can almost hear the rustling of angel wings. When, oh, when you begin to lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I'll tell you a story, and I probably told it before, but I'll never forget one night I stayed up late. I, we were past, pastoring a church in Birmingham, and our middle daughter was going through some health issues. She did all of her life. But I, I remember I went into, into our guest bedroom, which was next to the girls' bedroom. Shay and Cassie shared a, uh, shared a room together. I went in the guest bedroom. Peggy went on to bed. And I began to pray and just pray and pray. And I mean, I was praying, and, and the glory of God came down that place. Next thing I know, I was praying in tongues, and, and I'm, I'm just all over that place. I'm shouting and praising God and trying not to wake anybody up. And, and, and I don't know how. I can't explain to you how I knew it, but I knew angels walked in that room. Amen. And I went to bed. I'm still kind of quaking in the spirit and kind of start still speaking a few syllables in, in tongues. And Peggy wakes up and she said, what in the world's going on? I said, Peggy, they ha there are angels that have come in this house. I said, I was in there praying a few moments ago and I said, I felt them and I heard them in the room. Some people go looking for demons everywhere. I'm telling you, I'm looking for the presence of God. Amen. The next morning, Shay got up. Shay was, I think, in third grade, second or third grade. I was still in bed asleep. Peggy got her up to go to school. And Shay said, Mama, the strangest thing happened last night. I had not, I had been, not been up. I had not mentioned anything. Didn't say anything out loud the night before. Shay told Peggy, she said, an angel walked in mine and cast his room last night. And, and Peggy said, well, what did that angel do? She said that angel walked over there to Cassie's bed and bent over. And I think she said, kiss Cassie. Bent over and touched her, kissed her, did something. And, and she said, what happened to the angel after that? said, the angel raised up and disappeared. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, you might say, well, that's just a kid. Put, the, put it all together. There's a message there. We, we entertain angels unaware. I, bore my gosh, sure. I believe when we show up on Sunday morning and we may walk in and we just might have a hard time getting cranked up. We might have a hard time getting in the... I mean, we just may be... We might be struggling. We might be saying, oh, that brother over there, he's really getting with it. I wish I could feel, it, feel something like he's feeling it. Look at that sister over there. She's a, she's a quaking and doing that Holy Ghost, that, that, uh, that Holy Ghost shake. I wish, oh, I wish I could get on me. I, I wish I could get a breakthrough. And about that time... We, just, we say, I'm going to make a sacrifice of praise here. I may not feel what that brother's feeling. I may not be quaking like that sister over there. I'm going to make a sacrifice of praise. I'm, I'm going to praise God anyway. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what my circumstances say. I'm going to glorify God. And all of a sudden, through that sacrifice of praise, oh, you might have felt like a dead man when you walked in, but life begins to flow. The glory of God begins to come down. And the next thing you know, you're doing that little Holy Ghost jig and saying, thank God, he's in the house. Glory to God. And the next thing you know, you realize God has got his angels camped out all around me. And they're ready to go to town on the enemy. They're ready to chase them demons that have been haunting me out of here. They're ready to chase sickness out of here. Thank God the Lord's working in the midst. Give him the greatest hand clap of praise you can. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop on that note. Amen. I got some more good things to say, but I'm going to quit right there. I tell you what, we give God praise. He's been in this place tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, we want to pray much for our services this Sunday, that God will move and that people will be saved. We had uh, just, uh, what, two or three weeks back, we had six people that received Christ. We know six, and then I think there was a couple others that were restored that day. Do you believe this Sunday we can see something that even surpasses that? Will you pray for a harvest? Will you join me in praying for souls to be saved? Amen. Hallelujah. All right.